Today we are going to the book of Colossians, chapter three, from verse one to verse eleven. Book of Colossians, chapter three, from verse one to verse eleven, and today the message is how to live in Christ. So the book of Colossians, chapter three, verse one to eleven. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature: sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these: anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today, and thank you for this part of the Scripture. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts about these. Part of the scriptures and help us to understand how we can turn our life back to you and how we can live in your word for you. So, Father, thank you for this time. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. So, last Sunday is Easter Sunday. We talked about Christ has risen from dead and how Jesus approached to those two who are discouraged in Christ. Because of their misunderstanding and because of their incorrect presupposition about what Christ should or should not do, or how Christ should, you know,、uh, rescue or redeem Israel. So we talked about that part, and I believe that right now is a very good time to think about how our spiritual life can live in God, can live for God. And sometimes I I know that Christians find it kind of difficult to live for Christ because the Bible is so so、uh, abundance in knowledge and wisdom, and also it has sixty six books in them. So how am I a beginning、uh, at the beginning of the path in following Christ、uh, know how to live in Christ because I practically have no knowledge about the Bible. And so I picked these eleven、uh, verses because I believe that there is like a sequence of actions in these eleven verses for Christians to set their lives straight into the Word of God, and these sequence of actions, if you follow through, I believe the Holy Spirit will continue to work in your life because you obey the Scripture. Okay. So let's look at this sequence of、uh, actions that have been implied in these eleven verses. Okay, so looking back to verse one, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So first thing you need to notice is that Paul say that since because you have been raised with Christ. So after you believe in God, first thing that Paul reminds you to do is to set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So this is important right here. This is the first step of action that you can take in your spiritual life, in your life right now, Christians, to live in God, to live in Christ. That is. You need to set your hearts on the things above, which is in the kingdom of heaven, which is in God. 
okay? So you need to set your hearts on everything, all the things in the kingdom of heaven. And if you find that, okay, uh, set your hearts is kind of abstract, okay, so let me break it down to this one. Set your hearts, it talks about your emotional attachment, okay? So you need to understand that your emotions need to switch from the earthly things to the things in kingdom of heaven, which is, do you love the things in heaven? Do you love the things regarding or relating to the kingdom of heaven? Meaning, do you love what God loves? Do you love what God loves? Which is, do you want to live a holy life? Do you want to repent? Do you want to do exactly what the Bible talked about? If the biblical principle says that you should live with your integrity, to be honest, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what the event right in front of you may be, do you love those things? Do you want those things? It's an emotional attachment to the things in kingdom of heaven. And I find that most of the time we don't think about it this way. We always say in church that, okay, you need to follow God, right? You need to love God, right? But then exactly how? We don't know. How do we love God? Well, it's abstract, right? So we don't think about it. But then Paul right here is say the first thing that you need to pay attention is that you need to set your heart on the things about. Did you not find out that it is extremely difficult for you to do something when the time you don't like that thing at all? If you don't like those things, it's extremely difficult for you to do it good. If you don't love those things, well, forget it. Eventually, you will fall down. Eventually, you will give up. When difficulties arise, there is no emotional attachment to those events or those work or those things. You will flat out deny and you will flat out give up. And most time, Christians, your emotional attachment or your emotional side, know it, realize it or not, actually make the decisions for you. If you don't believe me, look at the last thing that you, you bought or, or, or several items that you bought throughout the year that you still remember that you bought them. Most of the time, you think that, oh, my logical size, I think I need it or, or whatever. Most of the time, your emotional drives you to make those decisions. And God knows that. You need to love the kingdom of heaven. You need to love God. You need to love the things in heaven. If you say that, okay, it makes sense, but then the later part, loving God, loving the things in kingdom of heaven, if I'm new to the Bible, there's like pretty much... I, I don't have much knowledge. I don't have much understanding about what those things are. Okay, so to put it to the simplest term, okay, do you love the Word of God? Do you love reading the Bible? Do you love praying to God? It's as simple as that. You don't have to understand or fully have the full comprehension about what the Bible is talking about in order for you to love the Word of God. And most about all is that last week is Easter Sunday. Once again, we remind everyone that God loves you so much that he sent his only son to die for you. And when the time you believe in him, okay, when the time you believe in God, his love actually touches your life. And exactly because of the love of God, you believe in Jesus Christ. And so in respond in your action or, or respond to the love of God, do you set your heart to the word of God? Do you set your hearts to pray? You may say that, okay, I don't understand or, or, or um, I don't have much experience in praying. It's fine. 
is fine. Just pray. Start with dearly heavenly, a、uh, dear heavenly Father, and then say whatever you want to. Okay. God is not so judgmental to the point that oh, you say some wording wrong, so I'm not gonna listen to you. No, he won't do that. He knows that you are just beginning to believe in him. He will help you with his Holy Spirit. But then you still need to make that decisions that you need to switch your emotional attachment from the earthly things back to the kingdom of heaven, back to the word of God. Meaning, if there is like your favorite magazine on your right and the Bible on your left. Which one will you decide to read? If you only have like fifteen minutes max to read anything, and you can only choose one, will you turn to your favorite magazine? Talk about the latest, I don't know, fashions or sports or you know technology, or you will choose the Bible. Which one would you rather be? Which one would you rather love? Know it or not. You need to make that decision. An emotional side is the first thing that Paul asks you to do. Okay, and then the second thing、uh, in verse two: set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So right after saying set your hearts on things above, the second thing that Paul asks. The Christians to do is to set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Okay, and set your minds, meaning your thinking, your inner thoughts, every way that you think, should be what should be on the things above. Think about the things in heaven. Think about the things in the Word of God. So I do believe that this sequence is very important. Set your emotions and then set your mindset, because you after you set your emotions without logical backup, then you're going to do some crazy things that you don't believe you would do, and that would be the exact opposite of what the Bible say. Okay, you cannot just say I love the Word of God, I love God, and then. You are going to do some very illogical things and claim that that would be how you love God. No, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, you need to understand the Word of God. You can say I love God, but then I don't understand the Bible. But whatever I'm doing, I'm doing for the for for the kingdom of heaven. That would put you in a very dangerous place in your life. Because you have no guidance of whatsoever about what you are about to do, so set your minds on the things above. Meaning, have you actually sit down and put down your thoughts on paper and pencil, and go back to the Bible and try to find out whether your thoughts. Your concepts align with the principle that you can derive from the Bible. And this part, believe it or not, you will need help, including all the pastors as well, because one person will not be able to fully comprehend the entire Bible because it's just too much. So in this part, you will have to participate. In a Bible study, prayer meeting, or even maybe in seminary, you need to understand what the Bible say about how you live your life. And this part actually requires a lot of time from you. So this is exactly why you need to set your heart first, and then you set your mind. Sometimes it may go hand in hand, or 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 you know those two do not go too far off. But then remember what I said before: you cannot go too far with the things that you don't like. When difficulties arise, then you may flat out give up. 
And so, if you do not love the Word of God, when the time you study some books like, you know, okay, let's just go back to the Book of Moses, right? The first five books. Most of the Christians cannot exit Egypt. They will die in the Book of Exodus, chapter twenty, because it starts to talk about the Ten Commandments, how how Moses would would select people to make all those like you know in your heart and mind. I know it looks like furniture, but they all have special meanings. Okay, I'm not here to dissect all those things. But then most of the people stop there. Why? Because it's so boring. Because it's so irrelevant to my life. And I don't understand why the Bible record like you know the the dimension of the ark, you know, and every single detail about what to make and、uh, use what kind of wood to make what piece of furniture or 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 things, you know, it may stop you there. And that's why I say, if you do not love the word of God, it you you will just flat out stop there and then never exit Egypt, okay. And sadly speaking, I know a lot of brother and sister just stop there, and then either well, the better one may be like they skip it, okay. But then it also says something over there: you're not entirely in love with the Word of God, because if you are, you would start asking question in your prayer, asking God, how come you put all those scriptures there? What does it mean? How does it apply to my life? You know, obviously we're not going to make an ark right now, right? But then, how come with all those dimensions? What does it say about God? What does it say about our relationships? What does it say about like after I read it, do I need to understand? Do I have something there that I miss? That is so valuable that you put it as part of the direct revelation from you, right? And so, if you set your heart there. Then you can set your mind there, and this part is the difficult part. It requires you to attend Bible study. It requires you to actually sit down, and put your life, your all your concept, all your perspective, on paper and pencil to sort your life out on paper in which you never did it before. Okay, and then on top of that. You still need to go back to the Bible and compare each one of them. If you are serious about the Word of God, serious about living in Christ, then you will need to compare what the biblical principles talked about my financial life, my relationships with my wife or my 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 spouse. You know how to be a godly son to my parents, how to be a godly father or husband to my own family, how to. Be a dedicated servant of God towards the church and etc. So on and so forth. It actually is a lot right there. And not to overwhelm you if you are brand new in Christ, okay. Don't worry. It takes a lifetime for you to do. It's not like a one-time exercise, okay. Because under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He won't overwhelm you. He will slowly open one perspective of your life and ask you, urge you to work on that part first. Because the Lord is the lamb unto my feet, right? A light unto my feet and lamb unto up my path. Wait, did I flip it? The Lord is the lamb unto my feet, the light unto my path. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I flipped it. So one step at a time, but the most important part is still this: Did you make the decision to set your mind on the things above, not on earthly things, but the things above, the things in the kingdom of heaven, the things in the word of God? Did you make the decision to set your mind over there? Because I'm telling you, this is extremely important, but. It's so easy for you to be distracted, especially with all the technology today. Okay. In uh, you know, in when when I was a child, if you don't want to take any phone call, it's very simple. Unplug one line, and then you 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 cut off. Okay. There's no cell phone. 
And when the time I was like maybe six or seven years old, the first cell phone that I ever saw is like a brick that you can buy from Home Depot. And it's that heavy. It's like a brick. The battery can allow you to talk on that brick for maybe an hour before it ran out of battery. Okay. So we don't have internet. We don't. There is no Wi-Fi. There's no 5G or 4G or, uh, or whatever that over there. So to be cut off from all the information, all that you need to do is to switch off the TV and, you know, unplug your phone, your landline, not, not the cell phone. Okay. You unplug your landline and then you're cut off. Okay. But today we are so easily distracted by our own cell phone, by our own schedule. And it's so easily distracted to the point that you hardly focus on one thing because in my time in college, we focus on multitasking. And I know it's outdated right now. Right now we are, we're talking about we focusing on one task at a time, finish that one to the perfection and then move on. Right. But then still multitasking is still in our heart and mind. Have you ever tried to do your homework while putting YouTube on the screen? It's difficult for my time to do because my, my biggest screen at my college time may be only 17 or 19 inches. Right now the monitor is gigantic. It's like 34 inches to 49 inches where you can open like four screen, four Chrome over there. You are easily distracted. And that would be the biggest problem in how to set your mind in the kingdom of heaven. The earthly things are like, feels like a lot every single day. Your schedule is packed every single day. Even in our current safer at home order, you still have a pile of online meeting all day long to do what? distract you from doing this. Set your mind on the things above. This world is no joke. It will try everything in its book to distract you from the Bible, to distract your life, to distract your decision in determining how to live in God. And so that's why Paul said you need to set your mind on the things above. It's your decision. It's not anyone else's decision, but yours. So on the day that you see God face to face and God asks you, how come you did not spend as much time with me as possible? There is practically no, no excuses over there. Did you not realize that? When God asked you, how come after you listened to the message that I sent to you and you did not change your life, you did not follow me. Why? You cannot just say that, well, my life is full of opportunities and my work doesn't allow me to do that or this and that. Well, in some circumstances, I, I can say that, yeah, that may be true, but then I am not courageous enough to just say all those excuses in front of God because I know that even including me most of the time I may not choose to devote myself unto God why because I'm tired because I have too many things I have to care about my children I have to care about my spouse and my mom and the things and the work and this and that and then eventually we will be lost Remember several sermons before? We need to be transformed into the kingdom of heaven, transformed in the word of God, not to be transformed in this time and age. And that's the uh, book of Corinthians. So it's in your decision to make. It's your decision to make. Whether you want to set your heart and your mind on the things above not earthly things okay so in verse 3 for you die and your life is now hidden with christ 
in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. See, if you say that, okay, yeah, set my heart and mind in the Word of God. Yeah, so what's the benefit of it? You know, what can I get from it? And God knows exactly that might be our next question. And then Paul say directly right here, the compensation or the benefit of setting your heart and mind. On the things above is that when Christ appears, will come back to you. Appears, come come back to the this world the second time. You will, you will appear with Him in glory, meaning everything that is in God. And if you right now set your heart and mind on the things above, and when He appears, you will appear in His glory, meaning. Everything that he has, you have a part in it. It's that simple. It's that simple. Is it simple to do? No. But is it simple to understand? Yes. Because it, you need to understand. You need to understand. Following God is always simple, but difficult. Why? Because there is only two choices: you either follow him or not. <laughs> That's why the decision is simple to make. It's just that the difficulties lie right after that simple decision that you just made, which is you need to work hard to get it. Okay. So after setting your heart and your mind, and if you understand how important those things are, because it will turn your life around. Because you need to set your mind straight, you need to set your heart straight before you can take any actions. And remember, you all you all God is asking you is whether you decided to set your heart and your mind on the things about. Because once you decide to do that, the Holy Spirit will empower you. Will send his gift to you, to accomplish all those things. And if you do not do that, if you do not set your heart, your mind on the things above, it's almost impossible for you to take the third step of action to live in God. If you do not understand already, look back to verse five to verse eleven. That would be the actions that you actually turn your life around after you set your heart and your mind on the things above. Let's look at verse five to verse eleven. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature: sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these: anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self. Which is re- being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. See the action steps, this third step in how to live in God is the longest. But then you won't be able to do those if you did not set your heart and mind on the things above, because this world is fighting against the kingdom of heaven. It's always trying to get you back in this world, which is all the things that right here in verse five to verse eleven, Paul told you not to do. And if you look at it in the first glance, you would say that okay, yeah, those are all bad things. Normally, you won't in in your normal mindset you won't want to do it. But 
Will you do it? Especially when the temptation comes, will you do those things? You know, just take one thing that is very simple. Do not lie to each other in verse nine, right? Very simple. Right now, I'm teaching my son to not lie. Okay, do not make up excuses. Jesus say, "Let your yes be yes, and let your no be no." And anything comes out from you know in between, or or what you want to make up something is coming from, you know, the bad side. That's what I I told my son. The bad side. Okay, yeah. Feels like transformer, huh? The dark side of the moon. Yeah, the bad side. Okay. And so, it's easy to teach other people to not lie, but then when the circumstances around you kind of like giving you a push in lying, you know, or we will self justify about our lie, saying that you know those are white lie, those are good intention lie. So I lie so that people feel a little bit better. Is that so bad? And then we will self-justify about all those things, right? You see, it's extremely easy to back down when the time is right. It's so easy to feel like okay, it's now is the time not to stand up in Christ, not to live in Christ because. One simple lie may get me away from all this problematic conversation or or things like that. Easy, right? When peer pressure comes along, what would you do? Will you still claim that you are a Christian, or you will back down saying, "Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I used to go to church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. You know." I'm not trying to look down to you if you ever did that. Apostle Peter did that three times when he was trying to watch Jesus from afar, and people recognized that he followed Christ, he followed Jesus, and he was so afraid at that point that he denied knowing Jesus three times. So, brothers and sisters, do not boast. Or do not look down to other people if they are afraid. Because even Peter denied Christ. So here is a very good time to look at this action step right here. This five, first five to first eleven, all those things at first glance, you would say that you will never want to do it. But subconsciously, deep inside of you, when the peer pressure or when the environment kind of push you, put you on the, you know, spotlight, will you cave? Will you? And you see, this is exactly why you need to set your heart and mind on the things above, and all the time. By the way, it's not just one day, two days, or skip a Thursday. And then skip a Monday, and then only Sunday. You know those kind of things. Those won't work. You have to set your heart and mind all the time on the things about. Because if you are not truly in love with the Word of God, with the things about, you can hardly avoid doing anything that Paul asks you not to do in verse five all the way to verse eleven. Will you get disappointed when the time you sin against God? Of course, of course, the Holy Spirit was right there rebuking you. How come you do not stand up for me? You feel like a loser. You feel like okay, I betray God. You feel like no, okay, yeah, okay. Right now, I won't be able to follow Jesus. Right, just like Peter. Oh, I deny him three times, even though he resurrected. Even though you do all those miracle, okay, I will be better off going back to fishing, right? We've all been there, and that is why we also have a chapter saying how Jesus was very much, you know, kind and merciful, and 
encouraging unto Peter, asking Peter, do you love me three times? And God used him to, you know, shepherd his sheep. So this is the three steps sequence of actions that you can take in order for you to live in Christ. And this last part of the section, even though it's longer and I'm not going into details about all this, but then it say one thing, you need to put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Focus on just verse five with me, okay? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And maybe to your surprise, it's still in your decision to make. I saw some Christians set their heart and mind unto the kingdom of heaven, but then never put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Meaning, they accept their shortcoming. They accept it, but not repent. That is a big space that you reserve for Satan to walk right back into your life and lure you away from God. You see the danger in there? You can, you can accept your shortcoming or you can accept the things that you already did to the point that you feel like, okay, I accept it. I'm that type of people. I'm not repenting. <laughs> Funny, right? But it kills you eventually. I've witnessed brothers and sisters who did not do the part, uh, uh, part three of this uh, uh, sermon, which is in verse five, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. You can love the word of God. You can go to Bible study. But if you do not do verse five, Five, your life is not turning around. You feel like it's turning around, but it's not. You're stuck. You're not moving forward. You're stuck in your old self. You're stuck there and it's not making any progress. In your Bible study, you may move along with everyone finish this book, finish that one. But then if you never put to death your earthly nature, you're stuck in step one. You're stuck. You're not making progress. Making progress means you're walking with God forward. I never, I never hear anyone will be able to moonwalk with Jesus, meaning you feel like you're walking forward, but actually you're moving backward with Jesus. No, Jesus did not moonwalk. Jesus walks forward. He leads us back into the kingdom of heaven. So brothers and sisters, now you know why this is a sequence of action. You cannot skip one and jump to another. You need to set your heart first and then set your mind and then put it into action. It may not appear to be like step one, two, three in your life. They may all come together at the same time. It may take you what some time in, in the first step or and then shorter time frame in the second one and then longer time frame in the step three, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that, will you decide to go forward with God? Will you treat this as the eternal truth in your life today, right now, during you listening to my sermon right here? Will you treat it as truth in your life and you follow exactly what the word of God says here that you should be doing in your life and for the rest of your life 
until you see Jesus face to face or he comes back for you first. Either way, will you look at this part as the eternal truth and treat it as the eternal truth and you will make the decision today to set your heart, your mind and put it into action. That's what I care. That's what it matters in the kingdom of heaven. You cannot just say that you love God, but you're tired of following him. You are lying to yourself, which is also in verse nine, do not lie to each other. That's including yourself. Stop lying. Let your yes be yes and no be no. So set your heart, my brothers and sisters, set your heart on the things about and then set your minds on the things about because when you do that, when Christ come back for you, when he appears, you will also appear in glory with him. And so make those decision and put to death everything that belongs to the earthly nature. And if you do this, if you do this, I'm, I'm very, very sure. I'm very, very, very sure the Holy Spirit will guide you to live a life in Christ, in his holiness, and you will be able to live a holy life in front of God and in front of everyone else. And that is exactly why this part is so important. And that is why I believe God moved me to this part of the scripture right after Easter Sunday. You need to understand you believe in Jesus Christ. You are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. You believe in the living God. You are guided and protected by the Holy Spirit. And so these are the important sequence of actions that you need to take, you need to make in your life in order for you to live in Christ. So brothers and sisters, let's work together. Let's work hard together to be in the will of God and to live according to the word of God. And I pray that you will take the truth as the truth in your life and make it the foundation of your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and thank you for allowing us to have this time to read your word, to once again receive this important message in how to live in Christ. Because Father, that is your intention for us to live our new life. So Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to encourage us, continue your good work in us so that Father, we all live in the will of God and will be able to appear in glory when the time you come back for us. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.